All right. Well, welcome everyone to our UW system-wide water policy network uh, case study and methods presentation. Um, we have been having a series of these presentations this semester, and this is the second one in our series. So we're happy to welcome the group from UW Oshkosh to hear about the research that you all are doing. And uh, I'm Melissa Scanlon. I'm the director of the Center for Water Policy and a professor at the School of Freshwater Sciences. Um, I teach water law and policy here and a course um, on water consulting where our students have a live public client and work on a project together and an interdisciplinary team. Um, so it's a lot of fun to teach in the graduate school here. And I um, always look forward to these meetings of the network to connect with people from across the system and learn about research that's going on in all sorts of places. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Raj Grewal, who is our water policy specialist here at the center and um, is going to introduce the panels. Thank you. Um, again, thank you everyone for joining um, and have a good afternoon. Um, as Melissa mentioned, my name is Raj Graywall. I am a water policy specialist here at the Center for Water Policy this year. Um, I am from Milwaukee, uh, just not just, but in this past May, graduated from UW Madison in law and also got my master's in water resources management. Um, so today I'll be introducing the topic as well as our panel. Um, so today we'll be hearing about an inter interdisciplinary approach to understanding and addressing HABs in the Winnebago Lakes. So UW Oshkosh is conducting a four-year NSF-funded project focused on developing new understandings and approaches to addressing harmful algal blooms, otherwise known as HABs, in the Winnebago Lakes. This interdisciplinary project brings together researchers and students from UW Oshkosh, as well as a nonprofit, the Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance, to study the historical, sociocultural, ecological, and policy aspects of these blooms. This holistic understanding of HABs will be used to inform public education, outreach, and recommendations for policy. This presentation will focus on the methods and general approach used in this project. So today's presenters are Dr. Stephanie Spehar, the Director of the Sustainability Institute for Regional Transformations and Professor of Anthropology, Dr. Bob Stelzer, Professor and Graduate Coordinator of Biology at UW Oshkosh, Dr. Jim Feldman, Professor of Environmental Studies and History at UW Oshkosh, and Dr. Heidi J. Nichols, Professor of Cultural Anthropology and Advisor to the Intertribal Student Council. And I will turn it over to our presenters. Thank you. Thanks, so I'm gonna talk first. Um, Thanks, Bob. <laughs> uh, Bob, how about I, I'll just tell you uh, when to advance slides. So just stay on this one for a sec. Um, so yeah, I'm Stephanie. Thank you so much for that introduction. We're really happy to be here to tell you a bit about this project. Um, I'm going to just provide you with a little bit of framing and context for the project, but the main event will really be my colleagues talking about um, the approaches they're taking, since they're the ones who are actually kind of conducting the nitty gritty work. Um, so go ahead, Bob, and advance to the next slide. Um, so the, really this project is rooted and grounded in, in the Winnebago Lakes, which um, have tremendous um, cultural, social, economic importance to our region. Um, they serve as uh, drinking water for over 250,000 people um, in the Fox Valley region. Um, they bring in a lot of money and revenue uh, through um, tourism and recreation. Um, they're culturally important to a lot of different groups in this region. So they're really important. They're also subject to these really nasty, harmful algal blooms um, that happen here every year. Um, something else I want to say is that this project is really also rooted in um, what's an approach that's called social ecological systems approach, uh, an, which is an approach to understanding sustainability problems that really sort of understands issues like HABs 
as being the product of these linked human and ecological systems. And so tries to understand these sorts of problems as emerging from those interactions between the social components of a system and the ecological components of a system. So that's also provides you some framing for how we're thinking about this issue of HABs and also about developing a deeper understanding of these links and how people interact with them. Okay, next slide. Um, so the problem that um, we're focused on here are harmful algal blooms. So um, I'm sure a lot of you know quite a bit about these blooms, um, but just to give some background, um, these boom, blooms consist primarily of cyanobacteria, which are often called blue-green algae. Um, they can be toxic for humans and other animals. Um, they are a significant problem in freshwater systems worldwide, not just obviously in the Winnebago Lakes, but in lakes throughout our region and also uh, throughout the world. They have really big economic health and cultural impacts. And just this number I give here, 1 billion in losses in the US over the last decades. So they, they have a really big um, impact in a lot of different ways. Um, they are primarily caused by excess nutrients in a system, like primarily phosphorus, but also nitrogen. But there's also other factors that drive harmful algal blooms, um, including warmer temperatures. Um, and these nutrients get into waterways and lakes from um, both point and non-point sources. Um, so, you know, point sources being like um, wastewater treatment plants or industry and non-point being runoff from agriculture and other sources. And um, currently non-point sources are um, really some, the biggest contributor. Um, and there's really no consistent public monitoring or warning system for HABs and their toxicity. So I'm sure you all maybe have been at lakes around our region, right? And you will sometimes see signage that sort of says, oh, if the water looks this way, don't get in. There's the possibility of harmful algal blooms. Um, so there is sometimes, you know, those efforts by public health departments or other regulatory groups or bodies to inform people about these blooms, but there's really no centralized consistent system for monitoring or warning the public about them. Um, okay, next slide, Bob. And this is just showing you some examples of images of these blooms from um, Lake Winnebago, um, but also just a little bit about the impact that these blooms can have. So the two sort of images and the text on the top, these are from last summer. These were social media posts um, about blooms on the lake that uh, you know were just going, were present on groups and, um, and sort of social media posts. Um, and you know these blooms, you know people don't people don't have a um, consistent understanding of when the water is safe or when it's not. They cause impacts on people's activities. Um, so it's a big issue. Is the point I'm making here? Okay, go ahead, Bob. Next slide. So our project is really trying to come at or develop a deeper understanding, and perhaps from that a new way of approaching this issue. Um, like I said, it's grounded in social ecological systems um, theory. Um, this idea of, of this sort of conceptualization of systems as having interrelated social or human and ecological components, but it's also trying to take that further. So it's acknowledging that a lot of times in that kind of work, um, social science is not sort of forwarded um, in developing those understandings. Um, and therefore, we often are missing aspects of human subjectivity that can affect these systems. And then also doing interdisciplinary work where you're trying to bring together, you know, social sciences, humanities, um, biological science, that can be really challenging. And if any of you have ever tried to do that kind of work, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's challenging in a lot of different ways. And so what we're trying to do in this project is take this concept and place sustainability, you see me mention it here, which is sort of a theoretical approach that um, one of our one of our team members has developed to really try to, uh, you know, approach understanding this system and then, you know, possible uh, solutions that are developed from that understanding in a new way. And this is really rooted in a reflexive process where we bring together the researchers from different disciplines that are part of this project, but also our community partners to have dialogue to sort of do an iterative iterative process where we're constantly talking and changing what we're doing to develop new approaches and therefore new understandings. Um, 
So that's that's really our the framing I want to offer you all. Next slide, Bob. Um, so this sort of gives you the main goals that our project has developed a holistic understanding of this system. Um, you know, an understanding of the sociocultural context, the ecological context, the historical context. Um, engage in the structured dialogue um, between members of our research team, but also with our community partners and the public to develop, hopefully through that process, a new shared understanding of why these booms are happening and how we might move towards sustainability in the system. And then we also have the goal of a lot of really sort of practical outcomes um, informing education, outreach, and policy um, using our results. Go ahead to the next slide, Bob. And so the first, what we really want to talk about today is that first part of trying to understand this context. And we're doing this through collecting a lot of different kinds of data um, on this system from these different disciplinary perspectives. So historical data, policy data, biophysical data, and social science data. Um, and that's what my colleagues are going to talk about. And we have a research team that consists of a lot of different researchers, um, you know, professors and academic staff, but also students. So this project involves a lot of students. So we have a team of around 10 students every year who are working with us to help collect these data. Um, like you said before, our community partner, Fox with Watershed Alliance. And then we also have are developing some other partnerships to do this work. Okay, so next slide. And this is where I turn it over to my colleague, Jim Feldman, to talk a little bit about developing that historical context. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for, for having us. We're, we're excited to be here. And Steph, thanks for kicking us off. Um, so I'm a historian and the director of the Environmental Studies Program at UW Oshkosh. And I only have a, a few slides to go through. I want to make sure we have, have time for for discussion and questions and things like that. So I'll try to be brief. And this first slide is just a reminder that this isn't a new problem. Right, that that people have been dealing with algae on Lake Winnebago and other inland lakes in the Upper Midwest for a really long time. Um, natural, you could say. Uh, and so this quote from the Oshkosh Northwestern in 1899 describing a particularly bad bloom is just a, a reminder of that. Um, next slide, please, Bob. So as a historian, I have got a range of tools to think about how we access questions about the presence of HABs and how people thought about HABs in the past. One of them is archival sources. For most of the 20th century, al uh, algae was considered uh, what was called an aquatic nuisance and was managed by uh, under something called aquatic nuisance control by an organization that doesn't exist anymore called the Committee on Water Pollution. And it was treated in the same way as rooted vegetation and swimmer's itch. Uh, and mostly that meant pouring a lot of chemicals into the lakes to try to control those aquatic nuisances. Um, the archives and the Historical Society in Madison contain all the records of the Committee on Water Pollution meetings, their, their minutes of their meetings, correspondence with people concerned about algae, uh, policy statements, research that the Committee on Water Pollution and other state agencies were doing on different methods for controlling algae and rooted vegetation and swimmer's itch. Uh, and so they're pretty rich set of sources for thinking about how do people understand this as a problem and what did they think they should do about it. There's other sources as well. The understanding of this problem has changed over time. And so we can look at scientific literature from the past and use that as a document for understanding how people have approached this issue over time. There's newspaper accounts like the one that I just showed you that are a great way of accessing how people, not policymakers, but just your average person, thought about about algae and 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 how it affected their lives, and then uh, oral histories, which which my colleague Dr. Nichols will talk about in a little bit. Uh, and the other thing I'll just point out that one thing that's an interesting challenge for a historian, and this is something that Dr. Nichols might touch on as well, is that that set of materials that I've just outlined does a better job of representing some voices than it does others. So if we're looking for my, the voices of, of underrepresented groups, the historical record doesn't always do that so well. So we need to try and think creatively about how we do that. Next slide, please. So here are a set of questions that we can ask about um, that, that arise from this, this, these, these, the, the, the study of algae blooms in the past. 
Uh, I don't necessarily need to step through all of these, um, but just by by point, a couple of them, I'll, I'll touch on a little bit more more clearly or carefully. So I mentioned that we poured a lot of chemicals into the lakes to try to control um, harmful algal blooms. In the 1950s, the what was then the DNR, the Committee on Water Pollution, uh, and the Wisconsin Conservation Department practiced what they called total management. This was sort of the era of DDT, if you will, when the idea was we can and should do whatever we need to to make the environment suit the needs of, of humans. And so that was the, the framework for understanding al algae at that time. Starting in the 1960s, accelerating in the 1970s, new ways of thinking, you could call it thinking ecologically, start changing people's perspective on algae and understanding them as a problem. Other things that change over time are thinking about who do people blame for this problem? Do they even see it as a problem if it's something that's been in the lake for more than 100, well, more than 100 years? Um, and what do they expect to be done about it? Who do they turn to for relief from what they were calling aquatic nuisances? Other questions also are, how do other water quality developments in and around Lake Winnebago shape people's understanding or reaction to algae? Uh, I'll talk about that one more in a second. And then that ties into the use of the Fox River and Lake Winnebago as, a, as an industrial area and what people are using water for. And so as the mil paper mills in Fox Valley are forced to clean up their, their act, how does that change the way people think about this problem of algal, bloom, algal blooms? Next slide, please, Bob. Um, just by way of saying that there's a lot of factors that aren't, aren't new but that have different relationships to each other. So this list shows you the kinds of things that shape people's understanding of the presence of algal blooms in, in Lake Winnebago and, and the rest of the system. But these things change over time. So for example, one of the items here is drinking water. Up until the 1950s in August, people simply reported that in late August, the water coming out of taps in Oshkosh had a greenish tinge and a fishy smell. And they just thought that was normal. Improvements in the water quality and, and in, in the, the water treatment plant made that problem go away. So it's not something people think about now. So again, these factors aren't fixed. They change over time. Again, pointing to questions like total management, the use of chemicals and the presence of other kinds of pollutants in, in, in the system. Next slide, please. And then here's just um, a, a couple of brief starting off points. All of us are approaching this subject from our disciplinary perspectives and trying to figure out what turns out to be really difficult question, which is how do we ask new questions based on, how do we ask new historical questions based on the anthropological findings of, of Heidi and the bio, biophysical findings of Bob? And how do they ask new questions based on the things that, that I'm discovering? And so here are a couple of, of initial thoughts on that. Uh, and hopefully we'll circle back to these interdisciplinary questions, but I think I'm now gonna pass it off to Heidi. Thanks, Jim. I, I'm I'm just echoing everyone else, but thank you for having us. It's kind of nice to have a, a pause in the middle of the day to like talk about our research with people who are additionally interested. Obviously you want people to all be interested, but this is a nice little break in the day. So thank you for creating that space. Um, so I'm Heidi Nichols. I am a cultural anthropologist, um, and I'm trying to understand on the, from the social science kind of angle about how do people perceive these blooms. Um, and it's, as you see in this slide, it's talking about, you know, we have this like biological data that's been collected, chemical data, engineering data. We have all these different perspectives, and we're trying to figure out how do we combine public perceptions, the data we have into how do we put it into praxis and how do we actually influence policy changes or um, even maybe just community outreach into having different understandings of their relationship with the lake. So a lot of, uh, next slide for me, Bob, please. I went to go click myself. So a lot of this was kind of coming up, what are my methods? And we are doing surveys, so online surveys through Qualtrics, um, in addition to what we're calling short in-person surveys, where uh, really we've been very fortunate and have had these awesome students who get trained in um, ideally all of our fields a little bit, and then do short in-person kind of 
interviews where it's in a survey form, but an opportunity to get a little bit more than a survey would, asking people, what are their thoughts on the lake? How do they use the lake? What are their thoughts about blooms? What do they think caused these blooms? Do they think we have any power uh, to affect any kind of change? In addition, uh, students are engaging in participant observation. So they're out in the, by the waterways. Um, to just kind of watch how do people behave. You know, sometimes our behavior is different than our words. Um, might say like, oh yeah, I really hate them. And then watch someone go swimming out into the water. So it kind of helps kind of flesh out what are people saying. We started a photo project with um, hashtag uh, UWO HABs. We need to relaunch that. And I think um, we learned a lot about maybe let me rephrase that. I learned a lot about maybe some grandiose, hopeful ideals and maybe need to revisit that in a way that can get public the public engaged a bit more. And then we have some students who are doing semi-structured interviews. So these are longer term. You're sitting down and you're starting to tap into what Jim was referencing, oral histories, people sharing their own stories, um, trying to unpack a little bit more of um, th those perceptions without the time constraint or catching people in an opportunistic sampling out on their walk. But instead, this is an arranged time where people are knowing that they're giving up this time, et cetera. So those are our kind of initial social science methods. Could you do the next survey or next slide, Bob? And then I have actually a um, couple of students right now who are in their coding process. So they're coding for the questions, for what are the activities on the lake? What are the, uh, do people think they're harmful? In what ways do they think they're harmful? Do What do we think caused them? And then they're going through and they're identifying both superordinate and subordinate themes where we can employ domain analysis. And it's very exciting right now because we're in that phase of our analysis. And I just walked into the lab before coming here and they already have like six paper ideas that they want to get written and get out there. And a lot of it is, you know, should we focus a paper on how do people like, in what ways do people perceive this as harmful? Is it nuisance? Is it detrimental to health? Is it preventing people from engaging with the water? Um, and so we're just kind of working through some of those themes. Bob, could we do the next one? And we're trying to understand within those themes, what could be addressed or focused in on an individual level? So this could be, what can people individually do? What do people feel like they can or cannot individually do? What is the kind of cultural understanding of the power to affect change or the cultural understanding? Is it, um, what we're finding right now, for example, is a lot of people who are maybe walking and don't necessarily swim in the lake or maybe don't have a strong um, tied to boating culture tend to say like, oh, it's gross, but I just look at it and walk around it and I don't really need to do anything about it. Um, but people who maybe prefer swimming or boating or fishing feel a stronger need to want to actually affect some change. So we're looking at those kind of different cultural groups and then uh, communicating with our biophysical team about what are the things we need to look at environmentally to affect change for the health of our environment and then getting to the policy component. So what can we change on an institutional level? Um, next slide, Bob. Some of our summary uh, takeaway points right now are most people's perception of the water are really uh, relatively situated. So depending on where have you engaged with water before and do, you, well, I think this water is gross because I'm from, uh, up by Lake Superior and the water is so much cleaner and is so much more beautiful. Or I think the water is disgusting. I came up here from Indiana and doing um, kind of pool fishing. And in turn, this is so much better than the other location. So a lot of people's perceptions are tied to their previous experience. And I don't know that that's necessarily groundbreaking as much as we need to put that as our foundation to figure out how do we move forward. Um, a lot of people know what harmful algal blooms are, but not necessarily by name. Uh, something like, I think it was 43% knew what harmful algal blooms were, but then by the time you included cyanobacteria or split pea soup or showed pictures, now we were up to 93%. And that's a big change. And when we think about policy, it just means we need to uh, allow for, maybe people don't know the term. And so when we're writing uh, maybe signage, for example, 
yeah, we can mention harmful algal blooms, but maybe we should say things such as also known as cyanobacteria or have the images. Have maybe have you seen something like this, making this accessible and no, noting that HABs aren't a part of our kind of larger public rhetoric. Um, a lot of people aren't sure about exactly how it's created, but there's really great historical other like oral histories of uh, my grandfather used to swim in the lake. And um, I think there's something really cool that could be done with like elders narratives about the lake and what they've seen change through time. People are pretty clear that humans cause this. They're not sure how, but a lot of times the answers are just humans. And what I'm noticing is that Participants are saying like, yeah, I'd love to do something, but they feel very helpless of how to move forward. Um, next slide, Bob. And so if we were kind of thinking about tangibles or takeaway immediately is that we need to start identifying really doable action steps for people to feel like I can actually affect change in this way, even if it might just be one tiny behavioral change um, in their family's practice. Uh, maybe it's about how you clean your boats. Maybe it's about um, when you take your boats out of the water, where you fish, uh, you know, just even something people learning about like, oh, I didn't know this wasn't safe for my dog. So people feeling like they can actually incorporate that change into their everyday lived reality, I think is really important for us to actually try to gather public interest and a desire I think people want to, they just don't know how. Um, people also brought up about signage and maybe doing apps. I think people are just looking for ways to be empowered as our kind of takeaway on the human side of what to do. So then next, Bob, thank you. Um, a lot of this is about, we have to keep in consideration. There's a lot of defensiveness of like, oh no, I'm a farmer, but I didn't have anything to do with this. And, or, well, I'm in this new development and I know people blame me. And when we are pointing the fingers, we're really just creating divisions. And so we need to also, when we're thinking about how to move forward, how do we bridge that community engagement and component where, while we may know that there are certain entities that are leading or have a heavier contribution into the creation of harmful algal blooms. If we want to get public, the public involved, we need to find ways to bridge that conversation and not make it a blame game. But, um, you know, really, again, going back to making things accessible. And we also don't want to create panic um, and continuing to look and explore different partnerships. Next slide, Bob. So and you can even go to the next one because that's just a beautiful bridge, <laughs> bridge slide. But a lot of this is like, great, we have this social science data, we have this historical data, um, and we also need to figure out, I think, really, and what we're kind of going through and parsing out is how do we have that kind of, quote unquote, hard science, biophysical data communicating with our social science. Because sometimes we know, we know that this, what you're doing is not good. But also when we're engaging in that conversation to say somebody you're not, what you're doing isn't good, isn't going to actually help us understand how to change that problem. And so there's been some really cool um, conversations that have been happening with our biologists, our chemists, our engineers, our geographers, our historians, our cultural anthropologists to talk about how do we meaningfully kind of bridge these two, um, even if it means I can help communicate the cultural side? And for example, Bob, who's up next, to really help me understand what it is he's doing out there on the biological side. So Bob, I turn to you. Thank you very much, Heidi. I'm. Uh... Let me make sure that I can advance here. It looks like I have advanced. Um, thank you again for for having us. And I, I want to um, echo what my colleagues said about the importance of the really the multidisciplinarity, the multiple prongs of this of this project. There's lots and lots of studies, hundreds, thousands of studies of harmful algal blooms around the world. And those are important, but the vast majority of those studies are just biophysical studies. They just describe the blooms. Maybe they predict the blooms. So, yes, we're doing that. We're doing the the descriptions and predictions, but I of the blooms themselves. But I think what will make this project 
um, certainly more complete and and stronger is the is the all as as Heidi and and Jim and Stephanie have described previously. So in just in terms of the one piece of this, the central biophysical question, we are spending a lot of time just monitoring, describing these blooms, and then eventually we'll be modeling them. So how do cyanoblooms vary in space and time in the Lake Winnebago system? It's a large enough lake where it's, it's quite complex. You know, it's some tiny lakes in Wisconsin, you might have the whole lake in a bloom or the whole lake not in a bloom. Um, but uh, Lake, lake Winnebago is certainly more complex than that. And then, can, you know, can we can we predict these? Can we Can we even forecast these in the future? And to with a nod to the you know the the methods emphasis, I'll talk about um, what we measured in in 2023, and uh, many of these same variables will be measured um, next year and perhaps the the following year as as well. And so our main um, harmful algal bloom variables, which as Stephanie mentioned, um, almost exclusively consist of cyanobacteria. So in the summer, the the phytoplankton in Lake Winnebago, about 90% of that is, is cyanobacteria. So what so the two of the main variables are cyanobacteria um, cell abundance and, and biovolume. So you know the biovolume part is important because of course species can vary in their um, cell dimensions and cell size. So biovolume really gives you a, a sense of how much is out there regardless of, of, of species. And then we're also um, measuring cyanotoxins. So, you know, cyanotoxins. There's cyanotoxins that are um, can include uh, neurotoxins. They include hepatotoxins, which which can impact. Uh, you know, which it, it targets the the liver. And so that's uh, those are our primary primary uh, primary harmful algal bloom variables. And then we have a whole bunch of predictor variables that we're we're measuring. Many of these are are well known to um, cause or be associated with, with harmful um, algae. Um, Stephanie was talking about some of these, um, as well as Jim, total phosphorus, total nitrogen. We measure dissolved oxygen routinely. We're, we're, um, so we're measuring pigments, um, both in the field and, and the lab. And so chlorophyll A is a photosynthetic pigment found in all, all green vegetation, whether it be terrestrial or, or aquatic, including algae. So um, cyanobacteria have, have chlorophyll including chlorophyll A. Um, phycocyanin is a pigment, it's a photosynthetic pigment that is more specific to, to cyanobacteria. So for example, diatoms, green algae, which are found in Lake Winnebago do, do not uh, contain phycocyanin. So phycocyanin gives us a way to essentially measure how much, um, at least indirectly, how much cyanobacteria um, are present. And the, the, the photo I have, a, shown at the right there is, um, you know, darker, I would say greener water than than normal, even for, for last summer. This is a, a pretty heavy bloom event and it shows a probe, um, in this case, measuring, uh, it's a fluorescent probe that, that can measure phycocyanin and, and chlorophyll A. And then we measure um, chlorophyll A pigments in the laboratory and then a number of other uh, variables as well. We've been working increasingly uh, closely with uh, scientists at NOAA, because they, as you might know, um, use use satellites, they use remote sensing. And actually since um, 2016, they have remotely sensed uh, cyanobacteria blooms on Lake Winnebago um, in Green Bay. And so we can use these for a lot of reasons. One of the things, one of the ways that these data um, will be important for us as uh, predictor variables for um, models that were, that will be uh, developing soon, predictive models. So um, I'll, I'll describe our, our sampling scheme and, and where we collected the, the biophysical data in, in 2023. Uh, so this, of course, is Lake Winnebago, and we have near shore locations, eight locations that we visited weekly um, for a good part of the summer, from June, uh, late June through um, late August uh, last summer. And so we would, um, with students, we would drive around the lake and and wade, um, uh, just wade into the lake from these shoreline, uh, these shore locations, starting, uh, you know, starting in Oshkosh in, in Menominee Park. And then if you're working your way clockwise, um, ending in, in Brothertown, we plan to add a site 
uh, down here in um, uh, in Fond du Lac uh, this summer as well. And then the the dots you see, the purple, yellow, and turquoise dots represent um, offshore transects transects that we um, we traveled on uh, by boat uh, last summer. A couple of uh, occasions in uh let's see one in july and a couple in august where we would stop every half half a mile or so and and collect uh collect data so all those variables i showed you on the on the previous slide we, we would every time we would go to a one of these near shore spots or offshore spots we'd collect that full suite of data so that that has resulted in, in 142 cents sets of data points from 2023 and we'll you know we'll add to that uh, this coming summer. So th this just gives you a sense that you, know, you all know what green, you know, green slimy water that looks like that's probably experiencing a bloom. But I'm going to play this video just to give you a sense of um, what, you know, a typical typical bucket of water might look like during, I would say, a moderate to heavy bloom event. And we have one of the probes inserted So even from this view, you can see the colonies. This is a, a this is probably microcystis. It looked like it stopped playing on our end. It might just be lagging. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I restarted it. Thank you, thank you, Raj. So. Uh, as this video continues and you can zoom in on this, you can see these colonies and, you know, it's somewhat homogenous, but one of the things you, you can see is that there's, you know, some are a bit smaller, some of the colonies are larger than others. So this just um, introduces some, some variation, some noise when we're trying to take measurements of, of um, phycocyanin, for example, or uh, cell volumes. All right, so um, just a bit of a lag there in in advancing. Um, I just want to um, share some preliminary uh, data with you um, from three three of our sampling locations. So so what um, what is plotted here on the y axis is phycocyanin in relative uh, fluorescent uh, fluorescent units. So um, essentially, you know, the more phycocyanin, the more more uh, cyanobacteria. And the, the first um, bar graph is uh, Menominee Park, which you can see here in, in Oshkosh. The second bar graph is um, Fire Lane 8 Road at the north end of the lake. And then um, Brother Town is the, the bottom panel, and that's on the east side of the lake. And um, I haven't included these in this preliminary data, but on the, on the x-axis is time. And so each of these bars represents a different uh, sampling week. So there's a, about a dozen, a dozen of these bars. And so you can just get a sense for, uh, the variation when you, when you look at this among the three, among these three locations, for example, Fire Lane 8 Road at the north end of the lake, this, this is a log scale, I don't know how well you can see this, a log scale, 100 to 10 to, to 1 here. But Fire Lane um, 8 Road was consistently greener, consistently at higher phycocyanin, concentrations, hence um, more cyanobacteria throughout the summer compared to Oshkosh, where these bars are a bit shorter. And um, there was just only a rare occasion or two where the water was very green in Oshkosh. And then we looked down um, to uh, Brother Town on the east side of the lake, and there were some enormous um, bloom events that were uh, experienced in, in Brother Town and, and people that uh, were using that water, um, fishers and, and boaters and so forth. Uh, that were not experienced, uh, you know, those large blooms were not experienced in the same way, at least when we were um, collecting these data. And so this, you know, this illustrates the variation, like just across the lake and, and when these, um, in you know, where these blooms occur. And then if you, if you look at any one of these sites, for example, Brother Town, there's a lot of 
variation, orders of magnitude variation in just the amount of cells that are, that are there from from week to week, which is not unusual. That, that frankly is is expected. And you know, you you might have seen um, photos like this before. That these are this is a, a, a photo drive from sensors mounted on satellites that that uh, you know, NOAA uh, processes these these data and NOAA creates maps like this. On this map, the the hotter colors are higher concentrations of cyanobacteria. So um, on this particular date, it's partially obscured here, at least on my end, but it's it's a it's a date in July. And so there's um, you know an intense um, bloom activity in the north part of the lake and in the south part, and um, less so in the less so in the middle. And you know notice that that there's um, uh, bloom cyanoblooms occurring at this date in Green Bay. So um, it, as many of you know, Green Bay or, or Lake Winnebago provides, um, of course, not only much of the water. Uh, to to Green Bay, but well over half of the phosphorus, and so a lot of you know these nutrients that accumulate in in um, Lake Winnebago are, are exported uh, to Lake Michigan. So um, some of the the things that on the biophysical side that we're planning for um, this coming field season are are as follows. So the the biophysical, um, the field data collection that I mentioned at the nearshore and offshore locations um, will continue at, at probably a similar uh, frequency. And, um, you know, can eventually we'll have um, at the very least three years of data from, from this project on, you know, field data on, on blooms in um, uh, for Lake Winnebago. This is an addition to other efforts that are, that are being done um, uh, the NOAA no data set being being one example. And then we're beginning, we'll be, be beginning this in the coming months to start developing models where we can predict um, some of these cyanobacteria variables such as, you know, uh, cell abundance and cell bio volume from some predictor variables like nutrients and um, phycocyanin and, and, and so forth. And so we're, um, we'll probably use a um, uh, general additive models or, or GAMS um, so this is in the this is in the earlier earlier stages of development. One of the one of the nice things about these models, though, not only would these be just of general interest to, to other scientists who, who work on other lakes, um, but they could also be used as a as a you know, sort of as a quick response tool. And so if if we find that you know some variables that are fairly simple to measure, like like phycocyanin, it can predict a lot of variation in um, in bloom activity, then you know someone in the public health department might be able to, you know, afford one of these sensors without having to measure, you know, fifteen or or twenty variables. And we also plan to eventually um, test these models in in other other lakes. Um, you know, how do they work in Green Bay, for example? Um, so going back to the this this satellite data, there's a very rich. Bob, I, um, I'm so sorry to jump. I just want to make sure we have time for questions. So I just given you like a one minute warning. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> yeah. So um, the, and then we'll just talk about this. I'll just talk very briefly about the satellite data that we have um, on cyanobacteria abundance and ways that ways that we'll use that. We're, we're going to be doing some comparisons, some essentially ground truthing of those satellite data. And then something else we talked about is doing very intensive measurements of discrete cyanoblooms in Lake Winnebago. Um, you know, very rapid measurements um, over very, you know, very short distances, uh, for example. So that's something else we're thinking about for uh, this summer. And so that is, uh, that I think brings us to this slide where Stephanie's gonna- Yeah, and continue, all I will say right? here is yeah, thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. All sure. so we can get into discussion is this is a four-year project, so we have two years left in it. There's a lot more to come. Um, in particular, starting to develop some of those community engagement and outreach tools that we want to create from our results, and also bringing together all the stuff you've heard here from all these different perspectives in meaningful ways. And that's you know that's where I think some of the hardest work of this project comes in. And that's the work we're going to be engaged in, in particular over the next couple of years, is figuring out how to bring this all together to develop new understandings. So um, I think I'll stop there. 
and open it up for questions, discussion, et cetera. Wonderful. Thank you, Stephanie and the rest of the team. Um, maybe you can stop sharing the screen and I would invite anyone who wants to participate in the discussion now to just turn on their cameras and we can have an open discussion. And I'm sure, Melissa, you saw you got an answer from both Stephanie and I. Um, I also meant it is both, both a yes and a no, not to no. That's always fun when you see that you've done a yeah. table with everybody. Um, well, we should probably repeat that here for the video since people will watch this video later. Um, what I was asking is uh, whether or not the biological sampling sites were the same as the ones used for the social science surveying. So would you guys like to answer that? Sure. The we So we did a smaller iteration of this project. Um, what is that now? Two and a half summers ago. Well, two summers ago. I guess we don't measure half summers. But in it, that one was a much more intentional kind of pairing of both bio data collection and um, ethnographic data collection. And there's kind of two things. One, we're working through on actually needing to like we have the data analyzed on both our ends and then having to have those have a conversation um, together. One thing we did run into is even though you may say to people, what do you think about the water today? The answers still keep coming back to overall, I think the water is great. So it's a slightly skewed response when you kind of calculate for people are talking sometimes generally and less so in that moment. Um, in this iteration, we have done a bit of a mix. So we have both some like quick biophysical data being collected while ethnographic data is being collected. And then the sites very specifically that Bob is collecting, we have students at those same sites asking questions. What we talked about for the summer is maybe having, I, it's being said in a cutesy way right now, but kind of like algal bloom hunters and that we would have both bio and ethno students working together to go out and kind of chase algal blooms. It's something we're playing with to try to see if there's any difference in what are those perceptions. So then Bob takes teams out into the water like he was showing um and all over the lake and the ethnographic students have been kind of going all over the lake and beyond the lake, just even being maybe at festivals and farmers markets to ask questions about what do you think about the water? Since so many people, maybe you can't catch them in real time at that space, but so many people interact with the water. It's a long winded way of saying yes and no. Thanks. Uh, Bob, did you have something to add? I, I, yeah, I, not much to add. Um, it, we, there are some, I would say, sentinel sites that drew attention from both of us, from, let's say, um, my team and, and Heidi's team of students. Um, High Cliff State Park is a good example of that. Um, High Cliff State Park you might have noticed was one of the um, near shore sampling locations. It was also the the end location of our offshore transects. And that's a, you know, that's a very popular state park. And there's often people milling about there, swimming, boating, camping, and so forth. And I know that was one of the more visited spots for the um for the surveys. I think that's correct, Heidi, isn't it? And um, some of the other ones, you know, would lend themselves, I think, less to to interviews because, for example, that Fire Lane 8 Road site that I mentioned at the north end of the lake is is essentially just a boat ramp that doesn't get visited very often. But it's a really nice location to capture bloom activity at that north end. And so some locations do lend themselves more to um, both types of inquiry, you know, the ethnographic and the biophysical. Yeah. Um, well, I grew up on the north end of that lake. So I. it's interesting that you say Fire Lane 8 doesn't get very much activity because that was where we went swimming all the time. What a small world. That's really interesting. 
So I, I, I'll add, I mean, just something about that, that. I could really feel it in, we would go there routinely enough, we would start to meet people. We, we met um, a couple people that were living, that live right on the lake, and they were just bemoaning the greenness of that portion of the lake for several weeks. I mean, they were really complaining about it. And, you know, um, you could tell they were very frustrated and they were just really at the mercy of these of these blooms when they could recreate in the in the water and so forth. And so, uh, yeah, we were we were right there. We, you know, we weren't there. We were never there for extended. Large lengths of time during the day. But um, we didn't see that many people there. Um, I don't think we ever saw anyone swimming. And just occasionally we saw um, people launching their boats at that ramp. You'll have to um, have the students go there on weekend nights after dark. Oh, OK. That Well, well I'm writing this down. <laughs> and some of this is... Um, you, I mean, you touched on it directly by saying that, Melissa, is that sometimes having to be flexible about going when people, like I'm a, when we were interviewing this round of students, people don't work or go and hang out on the lake on a nine to five day, right? Like you have to be willing to go on the weekends and in the nighttime. And um, so we're hoping this iteration, we have a much more kind of concentrated bio team and a concentrated ethnographic team and talking about the importance of making sure we're actually going where people are when people are there. Just because they're not there at noon on a Saturday doesn't mean they're not there at, it sounds like maybe I need to be there around 8 p.m. <laughs> uh, and making sure. And the other thing we're running into is some sites um, may be like close, for example, to camping. And so maybe people are hanging out by the water and open to talking, but then there's that camping starts to become like a residential space after a certain timing. And like, is it really ethical or appropriate to be approaching people in that space without being able to knock on the doors? We're just now in people's backyards. So we've been toying a lot with what's the best approach. And this goes to what Jim had mentioned, and I failed to kind of support what Jim had said is we're also right now it's a lot of opportunistic sampling and you're out there and it's who's what where but this isn't really getting into um certain community spaces especially thinking about if we were looking more up on like the wolf river area and what might that look like and who would be the best suited humans to do that kind of work so maybe, for example, working with College of Menominee Nation to identify like, yes, I can train students and go in those spaces, but sometimes just because you know how to do it doesn't mean you're the one who should be doing it. And so kind of unpacking how do we approach getting alternate voices in the most respectful and kind of culturally appropriate manners. I mean, it's, um, you know, something that's a ever-changing and moving target, if you will, and how do we capture kind of a wider array of these voices that, especially like when Jim's talking about who's in the newspaper, is this the um, everyday farmer? Probably not. Is it sometimes? Yeah. Is this the, you know, it's going to, we just have to constantly think about how are we getting as many voices and also honoring those voices in their most authentic context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are good considerations, important ones. Um, are there other questions, Emily? Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Thanks, team, for presenting. I'm working on the Green Bay system, so I am, of course, really interested in this topic and where your results are. I'm also just so pleased to see NSF supporting an interdisciplinary Great Lakes project. That's really cool. Um, I am wondering if, I know that uh, emerging contaminants and PFAS is a different issue, but, and it's not really that kind of impact on recreation. It hasn't been such like a media thing as much, but do you think that there might be other lessons or things we can translate to other water quality concerns on PFAS because that's a, definitely a green base ecosystem concern, especially that kind of human understanding people's perception of it all? Um, I have a thought on that and then I'd open it up to my colleagues, but I guess I'd say, you know, one thing I have noticed and Heidi, please jump in if I'm misstating this is, you know, when you're talking to people about like water quality and, and, and 
those sorts of issues. And you might be sort of thinking, okay, I'm, I'm getting their perspective on cabs, but they often bring in a lot of other issues too, right? They don't draw those lines in the way that like we might as researchers. So I guess that's my way of saying, I, I do think there is there are probably broader applications of the the information we're gathering, particularly on the side of like the way people understand and think about and what they know about the watershed and the lakes. And um, so, yes, I do. I do think so. I mean, we're not as far as I know, we're not asking them about PFAS specifically, but I think there's a lot of overlap that could make this relevant. And Heidi, I don't know if you have further thoughts on that. I really think that you said it. I mean, a lot of times it's like you could be talking about blooms, but then it becomes, it, it kind of snowballs for lack of a better way. And all of a sudden, the next thing you know, you're talking about is, um, you know, people talking about dumps being near water. I mean, it, it just keeps going. And so, um, especially for our larger in-depth interviews, I mean, I think the goal, right, is you have all these transcriptions, and while we might be trying to answer these research questions, there's actually all this other stuff. And that one, yeah, we should keep gleaning that information, but two, let's say we, we're finding things that maybe were pertinent to your research and like having those kinds of conversations and partnerships that, yeah, I keep collecting more information, but if we have information that could be conducive, it would me seem like, well, let's figure out how do we get this information into the hands? Because none of us can be all things to all people. And if we're trying to solve these kind of water concerns, building these partnerships where we can say, hey, I found this in there. I don't know if this would be interesting to you. How do we move forward? I, I would throw in that um, when Steph kicked off the conversation today, she talked about the concept of, of social ecological systems. And so at sort of a, a meta level, all of this is driven by a trying to understand what what does it mean to think about living in a place and living sustainably in a place and and how how do how does people's reactions to habs let us ask about those things what matters to them what conditions how they look at the place they live and feel present there feel sustainable there feel like they have a long term interest in being there or long-term concerns about being there. And, um, you know, PFAS as a, as a new topic in that same landscape is something that, you know, indirectly has, is, is the kind of thing you'd ask the same questions about, right? Like when you, when you start realizing these forever chemicals are in our water, in our, in our yards, in our, in our, in our neighborhoods, how does that change the way you think about where you live? Those are some of the, the largest, most high level questions animating the kind of work we're doing. Yes, I'd also um, add, thank you, thank you for that question, um, Emily. The One of the advantages of, of studying these blooms is they're so visceral. I mean, from a, from, as scientists, we, we, we know they're gonna, you know, read off the charts when we see them. You know, certainly the way people interact with them is very visceral. They have a, they can have a very strong odor. They can leave a sheen on your, on your skin and so forth. And as Heidi mentioned, there's a high uh, degree of familiarity that people have with blooms or something like blooms. Whereas I think just the learning curve, as I'm sure you probably know more than I, is going to be very different with with PFAS. And of course, they're invisible. Um, water water could be very clear and look clean and have high concentrations of of PFAS. And so I think just the one of the challenges would, I think, will be um, educating people about this weird class of complex chemicals that comes from so many different, you know, human synthetic processes. Well, um, I really look forward to hearing more about this project as it goes forward. It's great. You've got a five-year timeline. So we'll be able to check in and see what happens after you do your policy analysis and you have, you know, more years of this. Um, but thank you guys for being here today. This was really wonderful. And uh, I'd love to give you a round of applause and ask everyone to join in. So thank you. Thank you. Um, one last announcement before we close out, we have our 
water policy scholar applications open right now. We have a request for proposals out and the applications are due on Monday, March 18th. So if you wanna become one of our scholars, funded scholars, um, check it out and get your application in for our consideration. Uh, we'll see you hopefully in April when we hear from this year's water policy scholar talking about the research that they've been doing on access to data, uh, water related data for tribes. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for organizing. <laughs>